Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Stories with Ori. I'm Ori Spado, and today I am sitting with a gentleman that you're going to want to know a lot about. His name is Jeff Santos. Now, Jeff is a writer and director in Hollywood, and he's done some great movies about the Hells Angels. So we want to talk about the Hells Angels today. We want to talk about Jeff. And Jeff is going to tell you who his father was. For all you baseball players, I guarantee you, you know who his father was. Jeff, how are you this morning? Oh, great, Ori. Great to be here. My dad's Ron Santo. Santo, no S. It's Italian. Oh, it's S-A-N-T-O. There you go, that vowel. That, you know, Ori, that, that vowel, Santo. Um, yes, my dad was inducted into Baseball's Hall of Fame in 2012. Uh, two years after he passed, uh, he should have got in while he was alive. Um, and uh, he was the first Major League Baseball player to play with type 1 diabetes. Um, he got it literally after he signed with the Cubs. That, Cubs. that was before they had a draft back in 1958. He had, so your father had it in 1958. 1958, when they didn't know much about diabetes. Every, after his senior year in baseball, every team was on his mother's uh, duplex door step wanting to sign him because the draft didn't happen until 65. So actually when he had a star ball player in high school, the, the teams would come out to the home after the season ended their senior year in high school. And um, my dad had everyone, all the offers, and he chose the Cubs. They were probably one of the lowest offers, but his stepdad and, and his sister did some research, said the quickest way to the bigs for my dad would be the Cubs. And well, it was. He got to the bigs when he was 20 old. But that that day after he signed the contract, his mother had him go to the family doctor just to get a physical because back then they didn't, the teams didn't do physicals to check the players out. Right. So different, different time, right? And so he, uh, he went to his family doctor, then he got a call saying that there was high amounts of sugar in his urine, and then they sent it to a lab and he was a type 1 diabetic. And so he kept it a secret until he made his first All-Star game, and when he went to rookie ball, uh, the doctor said, well, you know, you're going to have to get on insulin. You're insulin dependent. That's type one. It's insulin dependent. He said, well, I don't feel anything right now. I didn't, I wasn't sick coming in here, walking out of your, off out of your office. So I'm going to the bigs like I have nothing. So he kind of went to the big leagues knowing he had a ticking time bomb in it. And then in 1961, uh, he lost 20 pounds during the season, went to my brother's pediatrician because my brother's brother was born in 61. And, and the doctor said, you got to walk out of here, Ron, with, with insulin or you're going to die. Your career is going to be gone, but you're going to die. And so he started insulin right there privately, didn't tell the Cubs, and he played those night day games, had to balance out when they didn't have glucometers or anything back then. And uh, quite a story. Went on to become a Hall of Famer. It's a type 1 diabetic. That, that's an amazing story. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a diabetic. <laughs> I never thought that I would live to age 63. Now, what people don't realize, my father passed away at the age of 62. Wow. And he had diabetic, he was diabetes, and heart problem. Mm -hmm. I got five stents, and I'm a diabetic. And I'm in the best shape of my life Look right now. Man. I'm going to be 80. But people don't realize how far medicine has come mm -hmm. along for diabetics. Exactly. Because 75 years ago, 80, man, it's probably about 90 now. If you had diabetes, you only lived an average of two years. Right. Life expectancy when my dad was diagnosed was 25 years old if you didn't take insulin, right? So, and back then is when they started having, they didn't have glucometers, so you had to, you had to urinate on a strip to see That's if you right. were low or strip. high. Yeah. And so him and my mom, they were high school sweethearts, went to the, went to the library, studied up on it, and they really don't know how a type 1 gets diabetes because none of us in the family got it. So it's not hereditary. But they say it's caused by a traumatic event in your life. And my dad thought, oh, there you go. His father left him when he was 8 years old and split on the family. They, so so he, thought it was, he thought it was that. And, and um, ironically, when he made the big leagues, his father, when he came out to L.A., his father showed up to the game first time since he left when he was 8, wanting to see him. You know, my dad said, ah, that's but it. you're right. I could remember my father. You had to pee on a little strip yeah. and depending on the color, high or low. 
Oh, high or low? And I mean, those things were impossible. Impossible. But, you know, I lived longer than 63. Obviously, I'm going to be 80. But you know what happened to me at 63? What's that? I got indicted. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to prison for five years. Wow. So I think that's kept me alive because I was walking the yard for seven me, miles a day. Right? Who would have thought? You think, huh? you know, something like that, you go to prison, but it actually saves right. you, you know, gives you more life. At the yeah, end. that's what, what I say. So prison could be good for you, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Especially you got health conditions. No, you don't want to go. <laughs> but uh, you know, Sonny Sonny Barger, uh, who did who did thirteen years in, in different stints of his life, and uh, I was a close friend of. You know, he was diagnosed with throat cancer, uh, like in nineteen eighty eighty one, eighty two, and was given like six months to live, and he lived till eighty three. Yeah, eighty three. He was so maybe then he went to, you know, so you, ne yeah. you never know that prison thing might wor be working. You know, a lot of people do not know who Sonny Barger is, but mm -hmm. he is probably one of the biggest Hells Angels oh, that say. there was. Mm -hmm. One of the most respected. Absolutely. And tell us your affiliation with him. How did you, well, first of all, tell us how you became a writer and director. What you do previously? I played baseball. I went to college. You played baseball I thought I was going to be a ball player like my father, right? Yeah. But, uh, you know, my dad came from a different area than us. You know, he grew You look like a baseball player. Well, I, I was a baseball player. <laughs> <laughs> but I just didn't play in a box. Um, um, I played Division I college, college baseball. That's as far as I got. Um, and, I, and I actually, you know, I loved the game. I just, my dad, my brother and I were good, but my dad was great. You know, that's how it goes. Those guys are great. Um, and my dad came from the inner city, so he was a, he was a street kid, you know, baseball got him off the streets, you know, he had a, he had a minor league ball park, park, uh, block from his duplex. So yeah. he started working there as a, as a kid at 10, you know, all the way up to the clubhouse boy at 18. So, so, um, you know, my dad was an inner city guy. So baseball, he had a more of an edge. I got that edge later, you know, in life when I actually went on my own to become a writer. Baseball didn't work out, so I got a, I got a, uh, um, I helped out John Cusack in a film called Eight Men Out. It's oh, yeah. uh, about the Black Sox scandal. Yeah. Remember when they all got thrown out of baseball? Right. Shoeless Joe, been a lot of movies on him. Obviously, Field of Dreams brought out Shoeless Joe. And so uh, John Cusack brought me out to the set and got me a part. I hit into a double play, pretty simple scene. <laughs> Um, and I got to meet John Sayles, the director, and that's when I fell in love. Like, I always loved movies growing up. I said, you know, I'm going to learn how to write. And I took that script, studied it, and then I studied more scripts, and before you know it, I was, I was in Hollywood. Beautiful. Yeah, so that's how I became a writer, the transition of a dream lost to finding a new one. Well, that's awesome that you're able to do that and continue. And, you know, a lot of times, what's what we had to do in life. We had to reinvent ourselves. Always but as long as we're willing to and we want to achieve things and become better, we can do it. And I try to tell people this all the time. That's absolutely true. You know, and we learn from our failures. There you go. Failures are put there as an obstacle for you to get over it. Yep. I was, you know, that transition is tough. Anytime you have a dream and then you, you want to be what your father was, right? You grew up in that lifestyle. You think you're, I, you know, I grew up in the clubhouse at Wrigley Field. So I'm like, this is, this is my home. And then when it doesn't happen, it's it's devastating. It's part of who you are. And the shift and try and find something else was very difficult for me. I couldn't do the nine to five job. I did, my dad wasn't that kind of guy. I didn't have that kind of lifestyle. And so it was difficult coming out here. But if you want to get in the business at the time I came, you had to be out in L.A. And I struggled and I struggled throughout my whole career, ups and downs, raised the money for my independent films. I've done five films. But it's, it's been a tough go, but I, I love it. You know, I always think, like you're talking about, you got to reinvent yourself. you got to evolve as a person, you know. And, and being a writer and a director, um, I'm, in, I'm in both guilds, so I earned that. Um, it's really brought me up a level as a person. You know? Well, you know, just being admitted to both those guilds, you, you've achieved something. Right. People don't yeah. understand that, especially right. the writer's guild. Yeah. Yeah. And so you achieve some things that a lot of people have not been able to achieve. Yeah. Well, thank so you. So God bless you for that thank there. You. you know, I happen to know a lot of Hells Angels in mm -hmm. my life, a lot of bikers, the outlaws. 
And I was in prison up in Lompoc with a few, what is it, the, outlaw, the Outlaws? What's the other big one? The Outlaws. Well, you, you're talking about um, the Mongols? The Mongols. Mm. The Mongols. Yeah. I was with some Mongols. They were good guys. I, the, the motorcycle culture, man, that, that's their society, you know? And how that works is I, I got to know the Hells Angels, and I got a lot of dear friends in that club. You know, it's with the Hells Angels, the Mongols, and all these organizations, and the Mafia. When the average person thinks about these things, they think tough or bad. Right. And they're right on the tough. But we're not all bad. They don't understand all the good things we do. Yeah, when you say we, like, I, that's the one thing. When I, when I was around Sonny, it was, I was a filmmaker, right? Right. So you don't cross that line and pretend I'm, you know, yeah. a club guy or yeah. as tough as these guys because these guys are, are as tough as they come, right? So, but what Sonny really respected me is that I, when I came and, and, and we did a film together, um, that I did stay the filmmaker. I did take care of the film side, and he took care of the club side. And that's how we had a partnership right. to make a, so a movie. Tell us about that movie, and where could people see it? Yeah, I did a, my, all my films. Uh, this Old Cub uh, is uh, getting a new digital release in August. It will be out on all the platforms, Amazon Prime. Um, most of my films are on Tubi. Uh, Jake's Corner, a family film I did with Richard Tyson and Diane Ladd and Danny Trio were in it. Diane that's Ladd. A, Diane Ladd, and that's in on uh, Tubi and Amazon Prime. So it's, it's, they're out there, and I did a film called Liar's Poker with Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Richard Tyson. And then Sonny Barger's film uh, was called Dead in Five Heartbeats. It was based on Sonny. Sonny wrote his autobiography that was a number one bestseller. And Fox uh, picked up the rights to it. All right. Still owns the rights. And I did one of his fictional books called Dead in Five Heartbeats. Because after his autobiography, he's, his life continued from 2001. He wrote these books with a fictional character about with a lot of reality from the time out after 2001. So the first book he put out there was called Dead in Five Heartbeats, and that's the book that I adapted. And we did independent, off the grid, with real bikers. So not really any actors. The guy, maybe two actors in it was uh, Grizzly Adams, Dan Haggerty, yeah. and um, David Della Rocco, uh, and a couple other guys. Uh, but other than that, it was bikers, right? So it's a biker film. We did it for the culture. Uh, we did it for real cheap, like three hundred and fifty grand, and really? and now it's 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 selling overseas. Uh, we sold over like forty thousand DVDs on it, so it's a real cultural classic inside the the motorcycle club culture. So yeah, it was a fun movie, and and uh, we toured it and went into different cities uh, with independent theaters. So I did distribution all on our all on our own. So it was it was it was it was a really cool cultural event. You know, I got to ask you a question because I'm an author of a book, The mm -hmm. Accidental Gangster, and the script George Gale called the other day, so you'll have it Saturday, which means sometime next week maybe. <laughs> but uh, writing a script from a book, mm -hmm. most people think it's simple. It's a very difficult it thing, is. isn't it? It is. You got to pick the you know, the plot points, you know, because a book, you know, you get into the mind, you, different kind of narrative, right? So it depends how you're bringing that book to life. And it's not just what's in the book, but you've had a lot of interviews with Sonny. Right. And you did that there. Right. So you pick up something, you pick up something, up something there, and then bringing it in and getting the dialogue and... Uh, you, you stay true to what the story is, you know, because Sonny's fixed different than his, autobi than his autobiography, right? So... When I'm doing Dead in Five Heartbeats, I'm thinking of the character Patch Kincaid. <laughs> and it's based after Sonny, but I'm, I'm taking what's from the right. book. And, and then different, when I, when I wrote Hell's Angel for Fox 2000, I co-wrote it with Rob Weiss, who, who did, you know, was executive producer, writer on Oscar I know Rob, Rob, yeah. And, and Baller. So Rob and I co-wrote to, that together for Fox 2000. And then... And then Fox got bought by Disney, and they put it on the shelf. Too bad because we wrote a really cool script, and it should be done. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great story. Uh, it's an American story. It, Hell's Angels are an institution, yeah. man. They these guys from World War II came back and started that club. People don't realize that. You know, they think, oh, it's drugs. These guys came back. They did fivers and and they went and said, we're going to ride together, and 
and do what we want to do. And that's how the club started. And then when Sonny actually literally it was him and a, he came back from the army because he went in underage and they sent him back at 18, realizing that he, he did that. And so on, he's on the streets of Oakland, and, and he's got a couple of guys. They bought a bike, and they're riding again. They're like, hey, they found this patch in, a, in a, uh, I think, a garage sale, a Hell's Angel patch. It was a Sacto patch. And they went to, like, the trophy shop and made patches for themselves, not even thinking there's a club out there because they didn't know. They're kids. They're <laughs> you 19. mean something he did it without knowing there was without already a Hell's Angel? Without knowing there's a club. It's a beautiful story. So he doesn't know the club. he got four guys with these patches on. So he goes, hey, we're having a first ride. We're going from Oakland to Los Angeles. It was like 19, I got it, had to be 50, 55, 56. And because um, he loved the wild one. That came out, I think, in 1953 with Marlon Brando, right? Yeah. And so Sonny says, we're taking a ride down to Los Angeles. Everyone bowed out. Him and one guy went. Uh, and they brought their girls with them on the back of the bikes. Sonny's bike blows out when he gets to Southern California. They're on the side of the road. His transmission's gone. They're like, what do we do? And all of a sudden, this guy, it was like mythical. Guy whips by them, stops, comes back up the, up the, up the uh, shoulder, and he's got a patch on, Hell's Angel patch. And it's, and it's, and it's, a real hell a real hell, and it's SoCal. And Vic Betancourt was his name. And he goes, didn't know we had nomads in the club. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I didn't know that there was a club, Sonny said. And that was, this guy brought Sonny and his buddy to their clubhouse, got a trailer, took their bikes, fixed their bikes. He stood over, stayed overnight and told them about the Hells Angels. We got like four charters and him and Sonny got along great. And, and he inspired Sonny to go back to Oakland and start a charter there. I don't know if Sam Fran's going to like that, but give it a try. We'll see. I'll stick up for you. I like I like what you're about. And that Vic Betancourt was really kind of Sonny's angel into the Hells Angels, and he wound up getting killed in a motorcycle accident a year later. Man. And Sonny started the Oaks, and that grew, to, that grew to become the biggest club. And really the club that really Sonny took to become outside of California. That's it's bigger where, than New York. Well, he, New York wasn't even there. Sonny then, it all started in California. So you're talking Oakland was the fourth club, and then, and then Sonny's like, all right, we're going we're gonna to expand. But for us to expand, we got to – they used to have patches where Oakland was Oakland on the bottom rocker and Burdu was Burdu. And then Sonny said, let's go all California. Let's all unite. And then we'll take it on the road and see if we can start some clubs in the Midwest. And, and that's how it kind of happened. And then, and then clubs wanted to be them. So he said, all right, you guys take it on. See who's the strongest and you'll become a hell's angel. And then – it went from there overseas, and that's all. That's all, Sonny. Uh, you know, taking that forward. So he is the Babe Ruth of the motorcycle club. Man, yeah. I didn't know. Everyone that followed suit after that. So that's an amazing story. Yeah, and so that's the story we wrote for for Fox 2000. Rob and I did, and it is amazing. We do. It was the origin story of how it all happened. They're stuck on the side of the road yep. and just tapping, coming down. There it is, Betancourt. And then to find out that they're all World War II vets and Sonny's dad. You know, he was always, he would sit at the bar with his dad and always loved the World War II vets that came home. So he was a kid of World War II. So he respected that. And a lot of people don't know that that's, that's where it all started. You know, when it all became this kind of, oh, they think they're criminals. Well, come to the 70s, you know, after Altamont and all that, that happened, I think it's the angels kind of got pushed into a corner. Like, all right, now it's a survival kind of thing, right? People are coming after us. And so you do what you got to do to survive, man. And, um, but the club has always stayed intact, and um, it's their own society, their own rules, and they don't play by the public's rules, meaning they're actually stricter inside their club. You lie to another brother, you're out. And so I Fox, love that about Fox that. Fox owns that. There's no way you can get that back, huh? Well, Rob and I have tried. Well, you know, there's, it's, 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 uh, there's a producer on it, so there's nothing, nothing we can do. But uh, can do, Sonny got me on that script because he knew that I would bring. Because there were four, four other versions with with um, uh, the big director uh, Tony Scott, and uh, well, Sonny didn't approve any of them. He said, "This is Tony this Scott." Isn't, he said, "Tony's like, so you're making a story that's Boy, not Tony's ours." Tony's been dead for a long time. It has, but Tony died, and then that's when he brought Tony passed away. And then Sonny brought me and Rob on to do the fifth uh, iteration of, oh. of the script. And we did the actual authentic one. The others were kind of Hollywood, 
you know, make their own spin on it. Not really the the origin stories that the origin story that really happened with with Sonny and the Hells Angels. Man. So we're hoping that you know they call us and say, hey, it's back on. You know, so you know, Rob's well, got more connections. What's your than next? That. My my next project project is called Wild Ones, and it's an independent film that I'm doing. My wife and I. Uh, are uh, producing and directing together, and I'm I'm going to play the lead. And it's about a aging motorcycle legend on one last ride to try and save his club, present day. And he meets this uh, burlesque dancer who's on the road. She would she would ride to different clubs on her bike, and he's going kind of into unfavorable territory. So he kind of teams up with her to ride with her to say that you're my girlfriend. She's like, I'm 25. How can anyone think I'm going to be your girlfriend? She doesn't know he's a legend. He's 70 and he's going on this mission. And together they form this, this friendship and bond because he's helping her protect her from an ex that's kind of stalking her. And uh, it's a cool kind of grandfather, granddaughter story, not a sexual thing going on, but just the lessons of life, like watch out for the snakes on the road. And, and uh, it's also existential because the, the, He's dying. The lead character's dying. He's he's got lung issues and he's mm-hmm. he's got an oxygen tank. And but he, his last mission is to deal with this guy who's taking <laughs> the club me. in the wrong direction. So it's 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 a powerful story about about a guy's integrity, character, always going forward, never in reverse. And so it's a good character. Well, that's that's great. Your wife and you both produce it. You have children. No, we have two Boston Terriers. Oh, two Boston Terriers. I couldn't have done all everything I did if I had children. I kind of lived out of a nomad <laughs> life in, in the film world, in the independent world. So, um, how many years have you been in the film world now? Oh, I got out here in 94 in L.A. I started, I wrote a play in 92, and then I slowly made my way to Los Angeles in 94. So, been here a long time. Yeah. Super. Yeah. Anything you'd like to say to the audience? Tell them how they could find you. Oh. How somebody find you. Well, you can you can find me on social media, Jeff Sano, but uh, also I have a I have a podcast called Peanuts Popcorn and Cracker Jacks, which is about baseball and entertainment, like the golden era of baseball where my dad came from. Um, and I'm also uh, check me out uh, I got a website, jeffsano.com to see my reel and stuff. My wife also my wife and I also wrote a novel called Ravens in the Rain. Uh, that has done well, and so uh, you could find us out there somewhere. Beautiful. Well, Jeff, it's been awesome having you here today. Oh, all right. Anything you'd like to add? Been a pleasure, man. Right. I'm glad you're doing this. It's, it just says you're never. I love you. I love anything, you. We right? could have sat here and had a ch- right. chat all day long. You're a living example, man, uh, and your story is great too. Just you're, you're a survivor, Ori, and and um, at 80, you got this podcast going. It's we're never too old to be what we want to be. You know, and I believe I'm 60 now and I feel I'm at my best I've ever been, like just in body and strength. And so, well, you know, I'm going to be 80 on December 17th and I'm going to go skydiving. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, man, I wouldn't sky. I, I, that, that, <laughs> <laughs> do what you, hey, if, you, if you're into that, do it, man. I got to do Italian, it. Though, man. Do, are Italian skydivers, huh? do we like skydiving? I always huh? I don't like bridges. I don't like. Heights, you know what I mean? People get well, pushed off the, that the, shit. I don't like heights. Yeah. I mean, I don't like looking down. <laughs> so, <you laughs> well, know, What are you going to do when I you're mean, up? I climbed down mountains. I jumped out of planes. Okay. But I never fucking looked down. I look up. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, good because, luck with that, man. I hope that story comes alive with uh, your your life story. It sounds it's, like it's in good it's hands. It's coming. It's in beautiful hands. I yeah, George Gallo's. Hands. They got a great team, so yeah. God bless. Thank you. All right, all right. You got it, man. Great to be on.